Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odyssey Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Lolly. This is an Ithaca Media Podcast. This is the podcast where we explore the lives and journeys of our guests, um, whether they be people in the business world or people out there in the community who have a very interesting story to share. Um, but my guest today is a coach who's called Liz Deborello. I believe I'm saying that right. Um, but Liz has had um, quite a, an interesting career in the corporate space and she's moved into um, coaching around leadership based on her story, um, which resulted in understanding burnout. And we're going to cover off on some of those things and also dive into some of her, um, what she's learned and how she works with her clients. So I want to welcome you to the show today, Liz. Thanks Thank, for coming in. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's great to be here. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you could come in. And this, well, before we even hit record, we were starting to dive into stories. And I was like, uh, uh, sit down, <laughs> let's get this. This is good. <laughs> I come from a family of storytellers. So yeah, it was no, really, it. It was really yeah. a shock that my um, career took a turn where I'm, I was in marketing, I was in corporate comms. So I've been telling stories for a living for a very long time and I come from a family of storytellers for oral history so it's been an amazing journey. Well if that's the case you're the perfect guest of the podcast. <laughs> this is like this is genuinely what um you know what I'm about um personally but also about this podcast is about storytelling and it's the it's your story today which is great. Awesome. So um and the story of your history which is excellent. But um I wanted to dive in because um uh, you have had quite a career in in corporate and I want to understand what that kind of looked like. Well, what were you doing before you were doing um, coaching? Yeah, so I started my career as a marketer. So I went to uni and studied marketing and then I jumped straight into, um, uh, actually they, they grabbed me before I finished uni and actually right. got me to start working in the accounting profession. So I some of my best friends are accountants, so I laugh because I said I've kept the least accountant-y accountants as my buddies <laughs> over the years. So, um, yeah, so I started basically marketing accounting services. So I think if you can do that and make that sound interesting, you can pretty much do anything. So I spent a decade working in professional services, so mid-tier accounting firms, and then I worked in the big four for Deloitte. So it was an interesting journey. And then I decided to change tracks really and go into corporate uh, communications, so public relations, some people might know that as. And that was a, a a genuine step for me to actually shift one career and shift into another. So that I did that for about a decade. And then I sort of got to the end of that and went, there's got to be more. So for me, it was very much about how can I use my skills and knowledge to, to do something different because mm. this wasn't really floating my boat. So 25 years in corporate Australia is a decent gig. Um, and as you alluded to in the intro, I actually left corporate land with a case of clinical diagnosis of burnout. Yeah. So tell us about that because um, yeah. that's that's obviously like a massive turning point in your life. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Absolutely. So I think for me, that was, um, it was actually the hardest thing I've ever been through except for, with the exception of losing my dad at a young age. And for me, that was all about actually understanding what how I am hardwired and how that came about for me. So the short version is that um, I just started to feel not myself. Mm -hmm. And as I was going through it, the interesting thing is as I was going through it, I didn't know that I was in burnout. So I only got the diagnosis once I left the corporate jobs. I did the quite dramatic mic drop. Yeah. So I sort of uh, met with my boss on a Monday I uh, and resigned. I signed paperwork on Tuesday. I told my team on Wednesday. I handed over my 97-line to-do list spreadsheet on Thursday, had a farewell morning to on Friday and flew to Koh Samui on Sunday. So it was quite the dramatic exit to corporate land and that was four years ago and I've never been back. But what I sort of did, I got back and went, oh, you know, I'm not feeling so great. So I went and saw my GP and he uh, referred me to a psychologist and I went and had a session and 45 minutes into that session, the tears started coming when she asked me about work. And she said, you've got burnout, we're going to start there. Right. So it was a huge shock to me that I actually had it. Yeah, so you weren't even aware of it. That's like, it, no. you, like so did you even have an inkling of what, what it was that was the problem? No, honestly, no. Yeah. And that was the thing that shocked me the most because yeah. when I look back, I think I, I'm i emotionally intelligent. I'm really hardwired into sort of knowing my emotions. I, I was so shocked that I didn't see it. But when I look back and I understand the symptoms, 
symptoms, I had physical symptoms. Mm. I had emotional symptoms. And the interesting thing was that for all of the are you OK days in corporate land, no one spotted it. Mm. So my boss didn't spot it, my colleagues didn't spot it, my family didn't spot it. Um, but when I look back, I had, you know, a, I had a cold for three or four months that I couldn't shake. I would have antibiotics and it wouldn't clear. I had trouble sleeping. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't resting. I had headaches, tension headaches. Um, I started to get in that emotional space of actually not caring anymore, that apathy space, which is really out of character for me. So when I look back at my behaviours, it was really clear to see that there was stuff happening that I was out of character. So I was getting angry. I was getting sh- uh, losing patience. I yeah. was stopping. <clears throat> Excuse me. See, I'm still having physical responses to that. Okay, um, yeah. So it's it's I was in that apathetic space of not giving a shit anymore, not caring. Yeah. And for me, that should have been a signal to everyone that something was wrong because it's out of character for me. So when I look back, I thought I was actually showing all the classic signs, but no one was trained or even asked me how I was going. And it happened over a nine month period. So there was a distinct thing that happened. And I took basically took on an extra half a job. So I had someone come back from maternity leave. Mm. So I had a full time person, and then I, they left, and the and the employee came back, and they worked three days a week. So I took on the extra two days a week, and I didn't delegate it. We didn't change the workload. I just carried the workload, and that was the learning from my therapist. What she was saying is, when you're in burnout you don't know because mm. you're in survival mode. Yeah, I was going to say, is it because, yeah, like you are just looking to get through it and you're not actually, don't even have time to, to focus on what, what the issues are. That's absolutely what was happening yeah. is you head down, tail up, push through. Mm. Um, give more, give me more. I would protect my team. I would protect my boss. I would protect the CEO. And I was in the drama triangle of being the, the protector, being the rescuer. Of people, but no one was rescuing me while I was rescuing everyone else. So for me, my biggest lesson out of um, out of that whole period and what I end up doing my treatment was six months of intense therapy. So I was seeing a therapist twice a week for six months just to get myself back to where I was. Mm-hmm. And some days that looked like getting out of bed, having breakfast, sitting on the couch and reading a book. That was all that I was capable of some days. So it was really intense. Um, But my lessons learned from that period is knowing how I'm hardwired and that I do have a predisposition for burnout and also that I was terrible at setting boundaries. I was shocking at saying no. And my third lesson was I didn't ask for help. Mm. So that's what I share when I do my leadership training programs, when I'm on stage and have the opportunity to talk about burnout is putting boundaries in place, learning how to say no and actually asking for help. Because my lesson was that by the time I asked for help, it was too late for me. I was already in that burnout phase. Yeah, and you said something interesting as far as the self-awareness. How does someone become more self-aware so that something like that doesn't happen? Because I I would gather that it's pretty common and probably more common than people think in the corporate world, in the business world of people who probably are in burnout and aren't aware of it. Yeah. So for me, the things that I always help my clients look out for is overwhelm. If you're starting to feel like you're overwhelmed, you can't get on top of your email. You can't seem to, things are dropping off. You can't seem to get uh, on track with knowing where your tasks are at. That initial sense of overwhelm is what you need to look out for. Because mm. that for me was the sort of start of it is I was trying to balance all these things and started to feel that natural sense of overwhelm. So that's something to look out for as a, as a, a signal. The other thing is to tune into your body. So if I had paid attention, I would have known that I had this infection that I couldn't clear. Mm. I was having trouble sleeping. And how that played for me was I would have conversations in my head as I was trying to sleep. And that stopped me from actually yeah, going well, to sleep. Yeah. So it's it's looking out for those physical symptoms as well and acknowledging that they're a signal that something is wrong. 
But I was I was just pushing through that and that's what my therapist shared with me is in that moment it's really hard to see because you are in survival mode, you are head down, tail up and you're pushing through. So the key for me is listening to my body as well. So I really encourage your listeners thinking about are you feeling overwhelmed? Go and have a conversation with someone about managing your workload and then also listen for those, listen to your body for those physical symptoms. Are you feeling tired? Are you feeling lethargic? Are you not sleeping well? Are you not eating well? How is, how is your energy level going generally as a signal to look out for that you might be on the pathway to burnout? Yeah, okay. And so from all that, what was then the motivation to move into that coaching space and become a become a coach like what where did that take place yeah so i've had coaches my entire professional career so i've had a life coach in my 20s um another life coach in my 30s i had a career coach in my 40s so when i actually worked with my career coach what we uncovered was that i have a genius so what what's that place where you know where the energy flows really naturally we feel at ease where you're happiest where you're 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 your most energy and for me that was when I was helping people so when I was coaching and training and mentoring um, and I just did it naturally people came to me for advice all the time so it was a natural kind of instinct and what we call the genius these days Um, and I distinctly remember when I was in a room with a pile of other people that we had the same coach They said, oh, yeah, Liz, your genius is coaching. And I remember someone sitting in the room opposite me and she was a coach and she said, hell yes. Yeah, right. Um, So that was a point in time probably about uh, four, nearly five years ago. But I pushed up against it. Right. So this this happened while you were still in your corporate job? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So this was, yeah, this was well before I left corporate. Yeah. But I knew at that point the reason why I got myself a career coach is I was unsatisfied in what I was doing. Oh, okay. So I already started to have those feelings before I left corporate that something wasn't quite right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that journey was really interesting. And where I got to after I, I stepped over that, that line was that, Um, The reason why I pushed up against it is that I had a leader tell me that I coached my team too much. So it was a block. It became the story Mm. that I told myself is that actually that's not a strength, that's a weakness. Um, And that was before I even knew what coaching was as a profession. Yeah. And then, you know, over my burnout journey, I just thought, how can I use my skills and knowledge to help other people? How can I turn my pain into purpose? And sort of sitting quietly, uh, I did, the ideas came. So like I would be reading a book and I'd have an idea and I'd pop it on the whiteboard. And then after a few months, all those ideas formed together as a, a as product offerings. So I started to think about, okay, maybe the, this is where the universe wants me to go. So listening into the intuition or instinct that we often have, that we're not always quiet enough to, to hear. And um, and then, yes, yeah, something really odd happened in, in the space of a day. I had someone reach out that I was working with asking me to mentor them. I had um, some my former coach call me and say you should do you should become a coach. And Out of then, the blue. yeah, literally That's, all in the same day. Wow. All in the same yeah. day. So I kind of went, Dear universe, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the instinct, yeah. the intuition kicking in, saying this yeah. is the way you should go. And the universe quite often says, come this way, come this way. But we're yeah. not tuned into listening to when the universe is giving us clues. So I went, it's time. So I literally, then I got an email from a training provider that I had already started speaking to. Yeah. So this all happened on the same day. Someone contacted me to be a mentor. My old coach said, you should be, you should go and be a coach. And then I got an email from a coaching training provider and I went this is it this is the sign so I literally got on the phone to the coaching provider and gave her my credit card then and there and said let's go um and that was uh three years ago and I've never looked back so um I was so and people that know me well they just say that I light up when I talk about coaching yeah and I just can say yeah yeah, I just love those aha moments when I'm able to help my clients to sort of get where they want to go because I can see and one of the things that I learned during therapy was that I have this ability to cognitively ladder so a client may be here and they know that they want to get there 
I can already see all the steps that they need to take to get there. So that's a process called cognitive laddering. But they get, we often get stuck. So quite often we get stuck in either negative self-talk or negative beliefs or we don't understand who we are as a human. We don't understand who we want to be as a leader. So we get stuck and we get in our own way. So my job as a coach is to help them get out of their own way and to get them from where they are now to where they want to be. And when they call me and tell me they've got a promotion and a pay rise, I was like, <laughs> I just I love it because that is me. I can see it for them before they can see it for themselves, yeah. and I just freaking love it. Yeah, and do you, with the people and the clients you are working with, do they tend to be uh, people like yourself of where you were in that corporate space, or does it also include people um, outside of that realm who are you know perhaps um, you know running their own businesses and in sort of other realms of life? Do you, do you have like a balance there, or do you do you, do you do you gravitate towards the corporate realm because that's your background? Yeah. So the majority of my clients are leaders in corporate positions. And I think that's a skew because that's that my technical background. So my network is comprised of those people. Yeah. But my certification as a coach is business and personal coaching. So I actually have a number of business owners that I coach as well. Uh, so it is a bit of a blend and I go f- and I coach people at executive level that report through to the CEO yeah. and I also coach people that are uh, future leaders so they don't yet have a team but they aspire to be in, in mm-hmm. leadership positions and a lot of variety in industries as well. So I've got, for example, one of the business uh, owners that I'm coaching at the moment is a musician. Wow. So yeah. in, in the arts, yeah. uh, through to a very senior leader that I'm coaching is a CFO reporting into the CEO. So finance background, I've got a senior executive in the health sector that reports into the CEO as well. So it's such a broad variety of clients. And the reason why that is, is coaching is actually industry agnostic. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I always let people know is quite often people come to me thinking they want a coach, but what they actually want is a mentor. Mm-hmm. So a coach. Kind of difference, yeah. 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 So this is something that I always cover with people before we even embark on coaching. Mm-hmm. So quite, and coaching is an unregulated sector. So anyone can call themselves a coach. And that's a bit of a bugbear for me because quite often I'm trained, uh, my certification is with the International Coaching Federation. So we have ethical codes and standards. And one of the key differences that most people aren't aware of is that coaches don't provide advice. So when you're in a coaching relationship with me, it's actually about me asking you really deep questions to get you to find the solutions. Yeah. Yeah. And then you implement the solutions and I'll hold you accountable to that. So that's the role of a coach by definition of International Coaching Federation standards. Mm. Unfortunately, people that are trainers or people that are mentors who give advice or tell you what to do, that's really a mentor and not a coach by International Quite Coaching Federation yeah. standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, there's a difference. And then at the other end of the spectrum, so the coaching is asking and at the other end of the spectrum is is managing or consulting, and that's about telling. So I consider it a continuum, and if anyone mm. visits my website, they'll see the coaching continuum. So coaching at one end, mentoring in the middle, managing and consulting at the other end. So that's the telling part versus the, the asking part. So I consider myself an expert listener mm. and an expert question asker because mm. it's all about you coming up with the solutions. So the premise of coaching is that my client has all the solutions within them. I just have to help them tap into to those solutions. Yeah. And then once you've got those solutions, you're so more bought into implementing the ideas that you've come up with. And I hold you accountable to that. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, I wanted to talk about um, values because that's something I know you've got a lot of um, things to say and a lot of expertise in. Um, I guess my first question would be, would, what, what role do, do values play in leadership? Um, so in that, in that environment of, of being a part of a team and, and leading other people. What, where does values come into that yeah. uh, equation? So values for me, so I'll start with a, a bit of a definition. So yeah. values for me, are they act as a compass. They help us guide our decision-making professionally and personally. So for me, it's really important that as 
as you're starting out on your leadership journey, so it doesn't matter if you are a a future leader or a current leader, you need to understand who you are. So it's about self-leadership at the start. So one of the very first exercises that I take um, my clients through, and even those that come through my training room, is who are you and what do you stand for? And for me, that's values. Mm. So I have a structured values exercise that I take people through. And it's really about understanding what's important to you. So what are, what are those things in life that are absolute that you absolutely hang your hat on, and they define who you are as a person. And once you have an understanding of who you are and what you stand for as a person, that's the best place to lead from. Because quite often, I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you have a leader that's a bit wobbly. They yeah, kind of like say that. one thing <laughs> yeah. and then they do something different. Yeah. And that's, that uncertainty is not having that clarity on who you are and what you stand for. Yeah. So literally one of the first activities I will take my clients through is a values-based exercise if they're not sure what their values are. So to give you an idea, you need to be able to articulate your values at any given time. Mm. So for me, I know that my values are authenticity, growth and respect. Yeah. And they help me to make decisions in life and in business. So the reason why authenticity has such value for me now and it's a value that bubbled up after I left corporate, because when I look back at my career, I've had leaders that were lacklustre at best and toxic at worst. Mm. And what they would say to me is be less argumentative, be less opinionated, be smaller. So what they were asking me to do was to be less authentic yeah, than who to not I am. Be yourself. Yeah. Basically, don't be yourself. Yeah. Just be a little quieter and don't yeah. be as questioning of others. Yeah. But actually, as a leader, that's our job. Mm. Our job yeah. is to question. Yeah. Our job is to explore other options. Our job is to challenge. And then once we reach a decision, everyone gets aligned behind it and we move forward. Yeah. But there's a role in being in querying. So for me, when I left corporate, it was like, actually, I, I will no longer behave in a way that fits in. Yeah, to fit into someone else's sort of um, expectation, is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. And definition of leadership yeah. as well, because what I found with most of my leaders is that they didn't know how to lead me mm. in the way that was important for me. Yeah. And it's something that when I'm leading teams, I always ask my my the people in my team, how do you like to be led? Right, okay. Because yeah. everyone is different in yeah. how they like to to be led and no one, none of my bosses ever asked me that question. So they're just blindly doing the best that they can but they don't have the leadership skills in order to adjust their style to suit the people they were leading. Mm. And as a leader, that's an important thing is there's no right or wrong from in terms of leadership style but it's about flexing your style to suit the needs of your people. Yeah, okay. And because obviously, like you said, everyone is different and therefore people have different values as well. How do you, I guess, navigate that territory? Is it it a case of finding where there's overlapping values? Or I guess like from, you know, from your experience, how how do you, I guess, coach leaders to, to manage that given that people are different? Yeah. And sometimes it can be asking your team members, what are your values? Mm. And... So they get that they understand who they are and what they stand for, and you can have you can understand where they're at and where you're at. Yeah. And once you get a handle on your values, irrespective of where you are in your leadership journey, you need to hang on to those and think about how they fit into the organisation that you're about to step into. For example, if you're changing roles or if you're interviewing, I always love when a candidate asks a values based question. Mm. It's like, yes, they've thought about values and culture fit, right? Because that's ultimately values are the glue that sticks an organisation together from a culture perspective. So it's really important that you know your values. So when you're stepping into an opportunity or you're assessing an opportunity professionally, you know what values are important to you and you can assess your values against the company's values because getting that values fit is really important because when you don't have that values fit you get this icky feeling that something's kind of off at work and quite often that's when the values are clashing right when your personal values are clashing with the organizational values or potentially your leaders values 
because yeah. one element of values is is actually articulating what the words are, understanding what what is important to you. But the second part of that is how do you live your values? So what are the behaviours that you demonstrate that show that you that these are your values? Mm. So when you've got a leader or an organisation that says one thing about their values, but they behave differently, something's off. Yeah, and so what is that? Is that a case of their they're not actually recognizing their true values and therefore they're, they're behaving in a way that actually isn't their values of however they've stated it? Or is it more so that um, there's an incongruency between what they say and what they do? What, where do you sort of see that? Both. Yeah. Both really. So it's, if, you're, if you haven't done the inner work, if you haven't been guided by a mentor or a coach to understand what your values are, mm. then you have that instability. You don't actually kind of know who you are and what you stand for. So there's a bit yeah. of uh, sort of instability for the leader. So if you don't have that centred, that really uh, intense focus on what your values are, it's very difficult to lead from that place. So firstly, it's it's up to the leader to know who their value, what their values are. And then when you don't behave in alignment with your values, you probably don't have the right values then. Right. It's like these yeah. are the values I think I should have as opposed to these are the values that are important yeah, to me. Okay. Yeah. So I actually, yeah. that's why I take my clients through a structured values exercise so they can actually understand what their values are and then you have leaders that are working in organizations where they might not ever have been in alignment with their values they have their personal values over here and they just jumped into an organization and they have completely different values yeah they have to adopt yeah so you have to kind of make the alignment Mm. but then you have some leaders so i've i've led a piece of work where i have redone the organization's vision and the organization's values and in that case, you, your leaders are going to have to realign their personal values with new organisational mm-hmm. values. If they don't believe them, if they don't live them, that's where you get that incongruency. Right, okay. So it's like these are the values, these are the corporate values, blah, blah, blah. My yeah. personal values, in their head they're going, my personal values are different, so I'm just going to keep my personal values and ignore these corporate values. Yeah, right. So I'm just like forget them. That's just words i'm just going to do my own thing yeah yeah yeah. and that's where you get that reputation impact right so you get this is brand liz and this is what she says and what she believes and these are her values these are the organizational values i can see the alignment but when you have organizational values outside are not aligned with personal values you get a reputation impact yeah yeah so where there's expectation of a brand and then there's the experience of working with you and if that's out of alignment you have reputation issues yeah gotcha and and do, do you also find as well that oh, uh, like a way where you really see values uh where, where values lie in people is under pressure in the sense of like under certain circumstances where you may not necessarily see the behaviors crop up until there's a situation that's you know, for lack of a better word, like it's sort of a bit hairy mm. and that's when you really see their true values? Is that is that something you've experienced? Not directly, mm. but um, it tends to, if you're paying attention, it tends to crop up in everyday life. So it tends, so your values are the same. My, my corporate values are the same as my personal values. It's all in alignment for me. Mm. So if I say that these are my values but I behave in a different way, it's actually you get that you get that really instinctive feeling that something's off. And I like to say to people, like, um, people have a great BS meter. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. You can tell when someone's not being authentic. You can tell when something's off. And that's quite often about values because they say one thing but they behave in a different way. And that's where you go, "Mm, something's not quite right. And I've always lived those things from uh, in an organisational perspective as well as personally. So in an organisation, it's really important to be able to go and have a conversation with someone whose values are out of alignment with the organisational values. Mm. So actually go and give them a piece of feedback to say, hey, on this day I saw this behaviour and this is the impact that that behaviour has. And it's out of alignment with our organisational values. And actually just be curious about it. Yeah. And try and figure out what's going on for the other person as a leader. But it's important to be able to have those conversations because the behaviour that you walk past is the behaviour that you condone. So by letting people behave outside of the company values, 
you're actually saying that it's okay to behave that way. Yeah, yeah. And that's not okay. It's complicit in, in what's happening. Yeah. And that then that person just repeats that behaviour. Yeah. Because it's no one's not, pulled them up on it. Yeah. So it must be okay. So I'll just repeat that terrible behaviour and repeat it and repeat it. And yeah. people will leave the team and there'll be high turnover and there'll be high levels of burnout because no one's had given that leader feedback that they're out of alignment. Yeah, okay. It's a really interesting it, place it, to be. It, it is. It is fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, can we have a bit of fun? Do we have Totes. Time? Yeah, Let's go. Sure. Um, so I, I spoke to it before, like off off mic, but um, something we've done a couple of times on the show is um, uh, Mythbusters, and obviously I, I tailor it to whoever the guest is. So uh, I'm going to throw some myths at you, and just like they're pretty rapid fire, and just, just kind of want your thoughts on it as far as um, uh, what you do. So the first myth is um, authentic leaders are born, not made. <laughs> BS. <laughs> BS, BS, why? Because we, our leadership's a journey. Mm-hmm. So as we learn and grow and we get more information, we adapt. And I also feel that way about our purpose in, in life. When we start our career, our purpose may be one thing, but then as our career evolves, our purpose may change. So it's an evolution. It's absolutely a journey. And I don't think leaders are made, are born that way. Like no one starts their role, no one starts their career as a CEO. Yeah. You learn, yeah. you grow, you fail, you iterate, you learn, you 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 progress your career. So I think everyone is like a muscle. Leadership's like a muscle. The more you flex it, the better you get at it. Mm. So if you want to be a great leader, you know, get yourself a coach. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, get yourself some really great mentors. Surround yourself with the right people that can help you to get where you want to go in your career. And through that journey, you'll evolve. And so will your values and your morals and your ethics and your purpose. Yeah, you know, I'm a big believer, like, in both of those fronts, like, A, having a mentor, but also the, um, uh, or a coach, I should say. Um, uh, but also surrounding yourself with the right people because, like, you just can't help but be elevated if other people have, you know, like a similar mindset to you. Okay. Uh, well, this is this is actually perfect because it alludes to what you said earlier. Um, leadership coaches have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Wouldn't it be great if we had all the answers in life? Yeah. No, yeah. so it's absolutely about taking the client on the journey. Mm. So as a leader, even if you're in, if you're a leader in corporate Australia, or anywhere in the globe for that matter, your biggest skill set as a leader is curiosity. Mm. So yeah. asking so questions. Really be, yeah, leadership coaches have all the questions. They have all the questions yeah. is the better. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. Be, yeah. yeah, and it's really about, you know, it's it's all about asking the right questions and, and that being yeah. curious and actually be actively listening in the moment where you've got someone in front of you, just really listening to what is being said and what is not being said mm. as well. So that's that really active active listening space because when you're listening, the questions will actually pop up. If you're in that curious curious mindset and if you're if you're present and in the moment with the person that you're speaking with. And as a leader, that's the biggest tool in your toolkit. You want to ask questions that help your team to come up with solutions. Mm. You want to help them to be critical thinkers. You want to help them be solution focused. If you give them the answers all the time, they'll never be solution focused. They'll keep coming back to you for an answer. Whereas as a leader, as coach, you want to be coaching them to come up with solutions. So a great way to do that in the workplace is I hear that I hear the problem that you've got. What have you tried so far? Yeah, yeah, and again, it's like flexing, like you said, that muscle yeah. just to actually give them the, I guess, the empowerment to go, oh, yeah, actually, maybe let's think about that. Yeah. yeah, and then next time they may solve the problem on their own Yeah, because you've empowered them to think about what the potential solution is Yeah, and you've given them a signal that it's okay to come to me with a problem but you have to have a solution in mind already. Yeah. So I would quite often send my team away and say, that's a really great question. Do you want to come back to me when you've got a couple of solutions? Yeah. Yeah. And actually send yeah. them away and get them to come back, having thought about what the potential solutions might be. Yeah, fantastic. Love it. Um, leadership coaching is all about soft skills and emotions. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? I have a problem with the word soft skills. Mm. So what I found over 25 years in corporate Australia is that Lots of technical people get promoted into leadership roles. So they're great practitioners at what they do because mm-hmm. they have great technical skills. Yeah. But when it comes to leadership, it's all about people. Yeah. 
Mm. It's less and less about what you were technically trained to do and more about managing people and processes and paperwork and systems. So what tends to happen is leaders get promoted, great practitioners get promoted, but they don't get set up for success with the leadership skills they need to, to manage people. To in that role. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, there's a ton of research that backs that up is that, you know, the further, the more you elevate your career, the further you get away from your technical competencies. So it's about really getting, building up those competencies so that you can manage people better. So I'm not a fan of soft skills. I prefer to say there's technical skills. And there's leadership skills. Okay. Yeah. And leadership skills, leadership is a, a very yeah, broad yeah. and diverse area. But un, having good emotional intelligence is really important. And part of that is is also having empathy, mm. being able to listen to understand instead of listen to respond, which is how we're hardwired. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a big bag of skills. This leadership is a big bag of skills. And I'm not a fan of saying this is my leadership style. You need ev- multiple leadership styles because you're tuned into your team and what they need from you in that moment. So you need to flex your style to suit each individual in your team. Yeah, go, look, going back to what you said before as well, like that you're asking them how do you like to be led, right? So you've got to be flexible with them, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. and that's something that I struggled with early into my leadership right. uh, journey was hang on a second. I'm the boss. Yeah, why do like, I have to? Yeah. Why do I have to do all the changing, right? Yeah. But that's why we get paid the big bucks because it's about understanding your team, understanding each individual, what excites them, what motivates them, what floats their boat, where are they energetically in the day, understanding them so that you can help them to be their best. Yeah. To hit their goals, yeah. and unless you know each other, human to human, that's never going to happen. Mm. So that relationship development, as well as understanding your values, understanding their values, figuring out what they need in that moment from their leader and giving them that. It's a constant, you're constantly evolving because they're evolving, you're evolving. You really have to get into it. Um, And I quite often say to people that I mentor, don't be in a rush to be a leader Yeah, because it's not for everyone. Yeah. And it's actually hard. (laughs) So don't be in a huge rush because it is less about you when you become a leader and it's all about your team. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got one more myth here. Um, (laughs) You like this one. Um, Once you've had leadership coaching, you don't need it again. (laughs) Oh, no. So that whole thing about leadership is a journey, right? Yeah. So we evolve as we get more experience, as things stuff up and we take learnings out of things, we evolve. Um, Things happen in life as well. So you have life milestones and things move for for you, priorities move for you. So it's really important that you adapt on the journey. So I've, and I said, I gave you an example. I've had multiple coaches Mm. over my life. depending on what I've needed in that moment. Mm. And because you are evolving and adapting from an age, experience, uh, career progression perspective, you need different things at each phase of your career. So one example, I've got a client um, that was in an acting role, was looking to get promoted, secured that role, and we started to work again. So we had a break Mm. and then... He he had like new challenges where he was. yeah. Yeah. So got a promotion. Um, and knew that they had something different that they, what got them to where they are was not going to get them to where they, to the next step in their career. Yeah. So there was a, a break in our coaching and then they re-engaged me and said, hey, I've got this more senior role. Can we work together again? Mm. Because the challenges in that role are different to the challenges when we first started coaching together. Yeah. So I do have clients that come back to me as they have different milestones, reach different milestones in their career as well. But you can, it's really up to you to be self-aware to know do, Where you are do I have journey, the right yeah. person, the right people around me? So mm. who is in my professional circle? You know, do I have the right mentors? Have I got the right coach? Do I have champions? Do I have the right people around me that can support my ambitions? So at points in your life, you need to just reassess. Do I have the right people around me to support me? And if you don't, then you need to look at getting different mentors or joining different groups, or doing some networking, or looking at having structured mentors, informal mentors, and formal mentors. So just looking at that composition. So it doesn't matter if you're a business owner, 
or an employee in corporate in corporate land, you need to have a good support network around you. So you just it's just a matter of reflecting and going, do I need a tune up? Occasionally I go, I ask that, it's like, mm, what am I missing? Do I need a tune up? So maybe I'll go and see a therapist or I'll go and have a coaching session. And I, I actually pay for my own coaches. Mm. I believe so deeply in the power of coaching that I have coaches to help me because yeah. I still have blind spots. Well, yeah, I, I remember speaking to a coach and she said, don't trust a coach who doesn't have a coach because they obviously don't believe in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I have a couple of coaches that I still yeah. use because although I can see where my clients need to get, sometimes I get in my own way with my own business as well. Mm. So I have people that I can bounce ideas off. I'm a member of a couple of masterminds where people are at different stages of their business and we can help each other with different challenges. But it's really important that I can't always see my blind spots. I can't see mm. my blocks. So I pay someone to help me with those as well. So it's just you need to be self-aware. What do I need in this moment? Do I need a coach? Do I need more mentors or different types of mentors? And making sure you reach out to do that because having mentors and coaches will just elevate the pace of your development, whether you're a business owner or you're an employee in a management position. When you have that accountability and a coach or a mentor to help you, you'll, the pace of change and the pace of evolution will be so much quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and that's a sort of a good note because unfortunately we are getting to the end of the episode. But um, before we do that, Liz, um, uh, how can people find out more about you, number one? I understand you've sort of got an offer for our, our audience today as well. I do as well. So if anyone would love to do a structured uh, values finder exercise, I'd love to offer that to your listeners. So it's a free PDF. It's my gift to, to them to help articulate what their values are. So we'll make a way of, of making that available to everyone. Yeah, we'll have all the, all the links there. Make perfect, it easy. Yeah. perfect. Yeah. They can also jump online to Leaders Lobby, which is the name of my business. So leaderslobby.com.au and find out a little bit more about me. Um, and also I run a networking group yeah, here I'm in Perth. Yeah, I'm kicking myself we didn't get a chance to talk <laughs> about that. But yeah, like if just briefly, if you could sort of tell us about how people can sort of get along to events there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I so you can either get a ticket on Meetup or Eventbrite and just type in Leaders Lobby Perth and you'll yeah. find us. And it's a, a networking community that I created because a lot of my clients don't actively network. Mm. And networking is a really important way of building that professional community around you that we spoke about, that professional circle. So getting out and meeting new people. And it's a really great blend. Leaders Lobby is a really great blend of people in management positions, aspiring leaders, and also business leaders. So as long as you're interested in leadership, all leaders are welcome. So it's a really beautiful, uh, diverse group of people at the event and there's networking at the front end, a seated le learning component that has a leadership focus and then more networking at the end. So if anyone is Perth-based or they travel to Perth regularly, just uh, just Google Leaders Lobby Perth and you'll be able to grab a ticket on um, Eventbrite or Meetup. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Liz, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been an awesome conversation. Not enough time. I, I don't allocate enough time for these interviews. I need to have like two, three hour ones. Um, but I hope um, we can get you back on in the future to talk about um, other topics and a bit more about yourself as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to coming back on at some point. Awesome.